Hi, I'm Mary Catherine Roper from the ACLU. I am sorry I don't have like exciting video or something to show you. And I'll warn you right now, if anybody was worried about uh, their CLE credits and whether they were going to get enough like direct legal ethics and law to qualify, it, it's about to all come at you. <laughs> so, um, you know, I work within the traditional legal system, right? I bring lawsuits um, trying to establish principles of, of constitutional rights. Um, and that turns out to be a really flat, inflexible tool in a lot of ways. And so we're looking more and more and more to technology and public participation and crowdsourcing and so on um, to uh, enhance our work and en enhance the effectiveness of our work. And as we do, we've already struggled with issues of legal ethics. I'm ready to talk about we get closer and closer and closer to these other ethical issues that other folks have been talking about. And I just, um, I'm going to have very few answers for you. What I'm going to do is walk you through a huge number of questions that we struggle with uh, in trying to do our share of this work. Um, of course, from a legal ethics perspective, the first command to any lawyer is that uh, in your work with a client, you are guided by the client's interests and the client's decision-making authority. Um, and uh, when you are representing, when you are working in impact litigation, um, there is a constant uh, tension between what you're trying to do and the people you're trying to take care of. Because frankly, we don't get impact necessarily by winning a client's case, right? Quite often our impact comes a lot from publicizing a client's case. Um, and also we don't, it's, it's rare, not, it can happen, but it's rare that we are able to litigate um, with a, without exposing who a client is, where a client lives, um, a, you know, and, and exposing that client to um, consequences, social, uh, employment, etc. Um, and let's face it, um, if if the if our cases weren't controversial, it would mean we were bringing the wrong cases, right? Um, so I mean, we're always working at a place where our clients are at risk, and we um, try to be very very conscious of that and try to make sure they're making informed decisions, sometimes we blow it. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example, and this is just kind of the kind of thing that haunts me. Um, and, and it is a principle of law that has been established since 1942 that school students do not need to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance. But every time, we get these calls all the time from kids who have decided for one reason of conscience or another, they're not going to stand for, they're not going to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance at school. 1942, this should be a non-event, and it is not. It is something that we write letters about constantly. Um, and uh, often when, when we, and we don't have to take those cases to court, right? The law is very clear, the news gets to the school district solicitor, and they, they you know change the practices, we're watching them, there's usually not official retaliation against the student. But then word gets out. And we have seen extraordinary community retaliation against these students. Um, and in one example, um, perhaps 18 months ago, um, we had actually advertised in, in a press release that we were advocating on behalf of a student um, in one of these situations in Western Pennsylvania. That family was so threatened and harassed they have left the state. Um, and this is, you know, and, and that certainly in those circumstances, our attorneys had talked with them and said, is it okay that we publicize this? Uh, people react badly to this sometimes. No way did we prepare them for what was happening and I'm not sure we could have. Um, and yet, you know, we sort of follow the model that attorneys often do, that is, <coughs> if the client consents, well, that's what you needed, right? Um, and, and, you know, we have uh, an, uh, an ethical, and uh, believe me, many of us did not sleep nights um, over this, 
um, you know, not just an ethical obligation, but a moral obligation, of course, to go beyond that sort of, oh, ask the client if she consents, um, and, and then go ahead uh, kind of model of doing things, which is um, something that plays out in sort of all of the work that you've heard talk about today. Sometimes consent may not be enough. Um, now, uh, could we do this work without publicizing it? Uh, we could. We'd have far less effect. Um, frankly, you know, the changes were, this is a case where I'm talking about not needing a legal change. Like I said, the Supreme Court decided this in 1942. Um, but, but a social change is needed to stop punishing these kids who stand up for their consciences. So of course we want to advertise this, but then look what happened uh, when we did. And this is not the first kid who has taken hell for, for this particular stand. Um, it's never been this bad before. Uh, and often we're able to organize some support for the family and so on before we do this kind of thing or before it, and even if we don't publicize it, it gets out, right? Somebody at the school leaks it and then there's <coughs> articles in the papers and so on. Um, and you know, in, in this completely routine, absolutely established area of the law, we are absolutely caught in wanting to help the, the client, wanting to publicize this, wanting to try to change what makes this such a dangerous thing for a client to do. And, and all of these issues of sort of consent and how you protect the client um, come into play here. Um, I, we have these same sort of, of debates constantly. I mean, we, we've represented transgender teens in schools who want to uh, stand up for their rights and, and be treated and respected well uh, with respect to their, their chosen identities. And, um, you know, and, and we don't have legal remedies often for those kids because what? Pennsylvania and, and on a federal level, there are no protections for, uh, with respect to discrimination against transgender people. So we don't have the legal remedy. The only remedy this kid may have is if we can guide uh, this young person through um, sort of a public appeal for respect and rights and so on and all the same issues you know come back into play right how much exposure is too much exposure how can you protect this client who is in this case only recourse is to the court of public opinion um, and, and so we're sort of constantly wrestling with those views as well as trying to give clients a really realistic expectation of what happens if you sue your school district, if you sue the local police, you know, if, if you're you're named as an ACLU client, whether you know, no matter how um, how uh, uh, where their your cause is, um, it, these are and it's sometimes we don't predict, predict it well, and that's when you know some <coughs> terrible things can happen to clients. Um, so those are all sort of the things that regularly play in, and those concern the absolute you know, established ethical rules about your client being the decision maker, you know, working within the client's interests and, and, uh, and things like that. Um, of course, the farther we get, you know, from just filing legal papers, um, the more complicated this gets for us while we're still in the realm of trying to reach legal change, to try to create legal change. Um, a really, uh, you know, an issue that we're, we're constantly talking about within and without the organization, within and without legal um, uh, advocacy movements is the role of right, videotaping in public and recording in public. And the ACLU um, has these very complicated positions on a lot of this, in part because when I'm talking about, again, constitutional law being a very flat and inflexible tool, it's very difficult to argue that there should be one set of rules for me videotaping in public um, and different set of rules for the police videotaping in public because constitutional law just isn't that flexible to really take into account the different 
how very different that me what very difference that means in terms of the power dynamic and the, the power of the person doing the videotaping. So if we want people to be able to you know videotape police activities and so on in public, it would be very, it's very difficult for us to say it's illegal for the police to have surveillance cameras all over the place. And let me tell you, although we have been advocating against that for a long time, that, that horse is out of the barn, right? We are not getting rid of the surveillance cameras. And so instead, we're starting to focus on what's done with all of the information that's captured, where it's kept, who it goes to. Um, you know, and when you're talking about protests, we know the Philadelphia police are videotaping protests and they share that information with the FBI. Um, and th legally, there's not much we can do to stop that, but in terms of advocacy, we can advocate for different um, rules and different treatment, um, purging after a period of time, et cetera, all this information that the police are capturing, um, and they're capturing a lot. Um, at the same time, of course, we want to promote the right to for individuals to capture uh, uh, the, the activities of, of public officials, and we make a distinction between, I mean, it, let me say we have some other sort of more nuanced uh, positions when it comes to capturing audio because the law allows us to argue about an expectation of privacy with respect to audio. Pennsylvania is one of the few places left in the country with a, an all-party consent audio recording statute, the wiretap law. In most states, as long as one person to the conversation consents, you can be recording that. We have fought very hard and sometimes um, uh, to preserve that privacy. Now, that's not always in the interests, right? I mean, I, our folks over, our friends over at the uh, the Innocence Project want to be able to record people they're talking to, potential witnesses to crimes when they're trying to prove the innocence of somebody who's wrongly in jail, um, and those people will not speak on the record. <laughs> So they want their investigators to be able to surreptitiously record those uh, conversations when it's going to that kind of use, but then you can't, you know, in the law, again, it's such a flat tool, you can't, it's very difficult to frame a law that says you can record for a, a good purpose, <laughs> but you can't record for a bad purpose, right? And if you can record a witness for the purpose of exonerating somebody, well, frankly, that same conversation is usually exonerating this person by fingering that person. Um, so you can't really make those kinds of distinctions. And if we can record to exonerate someone, why can't the police you know, surreptitiously record without a warrant um, for the purposes of their investigations? Um, and so you know, not without you know, internal debate and not without concerns, but we have taken the position to protect as much as possible that all-party consent rule uh, where it exists. Um, on the other hand, saying the need for consent always turns on an expectation of privacy, and public officials performing their public duties have no expectation of privacy. And so we fought those cases where you know, police officers or, or other public officials, if <coughs> someone comes in and, and they, you know, their treatment by any kind of government official has been less than exemplary, and they want proof of that because, of course, it's denied later, um, and, and they're uh, audio taping surreptitiously or video to, and or videotaping surreptitiously, right? But the law only deals with audio recording um, and, and us saying, no, that's different, right? Because that's a public official. Um, but if, what if you're recording that public official, but you're capturing other things? So again, you know, people say to me, can I record at protests? And I say, well, there's a lot at protest where there's no expectation of privacy. For instance, that person standing up there at the microphone talking has no expectation of privacy and, and you know, cannot legally, at least, complain about being recorded. There are all these other consequences, right, to the, the subsequent use of that recording. But while you're recording that person, are you capturing the conversation <coughs> next to you? Um, 
and what happens to your recording and, and could it later be used to expose that conversation next to you and not just um, the, the, the intentionally public presentation that was going on. Um, and so we're sort of constantly, not only because of the concerns of the wiretap law, but also concerns of really, you know, have respect for the private conversations that are going on around you. Um, and, and just because I'm having a conversation on a public street does not mean I'm shouting it, right? And does not mean that I don't have an expectation. It's going to remain private. And we get pushback all the time, right? And it even comes from the government. Like, we, you know, we see these arguments in, in lawsuits that we bring over, you know, NSA <laughs> reading our email or whatever, and they say, oh, people have known forever we're doing that. <laughs> And as if that excuse, like, so you no longer have an expectation of privacy in your email because you know the government's violating that privacy, right? I mean, we've actually heard that argument from the government, not as well as from public commentators and so on. And we say, no, 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 no. You know, there's, there's got to be room for an expectation of privacy. Um, so there's, you know, it just it comes into play in so many different directions, and as you already know and you've been speaking about all day, it's very hard to anticipate all the people who are affected and all the ways they are affected when you start capturing this information. Um, and this, this comes into play in, in our work over and over again. There's an active debate going on for decades in the legal community about the, the process of, of legal observing, right? legal observing at protests, um, when the, the, the National Lawyers Guild often, the ACLU sometimes, other groups send out uh, legal observers to see what's happening. Um, are those people collecting records that can later be subpoenaed by the police? And uh, is there any way to claim that that's somehow privileged information, um, those uh, those records. And, I, you know, there, there's some debate in the legal community, but it, it's a pretty difficult thing to protect those kind of records. So what is it that your legal observers write down, and what can the protesters expect of you in terms of protecting their privacy or not exposing them to um, uh, to prosecution because of, of what you happen to observe? Yeah. Oh, whoops. All right. Um, so, so let me let me just talk about sort of one one thing that has that's really on our minds, and um, love it if anybody sort of has suggestions. The whole concept of of police misconduct. Um, we have, of course, our stop and frisk lawsuit against the city of Philadelphia. We have a consent decree. We are monitoring the police reports about stops. That's what the police tell us has happened, right? And we are really looking for ways to get much more input from the public about what's happening to them, right? And whether that's video, whether that's sort of an app that reports when you've been stopped and so on. But in all of these circumstances, we hit all of these same questions. How do we, how do we manage that information? How do we protect that information? How do we... Um, uh, publicize what's being done, I'm sure. Almost everybody has seen the recent YouTube video of the just horribly abusive stop by the Philadelphia uh, police uh, in North Philly. And, and again, everybody's seen it, and, and those poor young men have been, uh, you know, just exposed over and over and over again to this incredible humiliation that, that happened to them. Um, and and we have the same tension of we, we want to collect lots of video about what police are doing. On the other hand, the police and the attorney will use those. So um, these are things we are discussing with defense counsel. We're, we're discussing uh, technologically. We're discussing just in terms of resources. I mean, we're a nonprofit. How do we even manage that amount of information? Um, and so from, from someone who's in a much more traditional and pedestrian uh, uh, line of work than the other folks you have heard from. Um, all of these things are, are still very much in play for us too, and and we really rely on on folks like this to help us find the way. 